Hello and thanks for checking out today's video. On our other channel, Paranormal Listed, we're expanding the type of content we plan to cover. So it just won't be about the supernatural or otherworldly subjects. We're also going to take a look at the unexplained. For example, in our latest video, we look at people who seemingly vanish into thin air. We'll have a link to that video at the end of this video. But before we get any further, we want to talk about our amazing sponsor, Magellan TV. I know money is tight for a lot of people right now, so you want to spend your money wisely. When it comes to streaming services, you should check out Magellan TV because it is a great value in both price and quality. It's the number one rated documentary streaming app in the Google Play Store. It's also the best place for true crime fans. They have a massive and excellent collection of true crime documentaries. No matter what interests you in true crime, like serial killers or unsolved mysteries, they probably have several documentaries that will catch your attention. If you need a suggestion on where to start, I'd go with The Murder of a Former First Lady. This documentary follows the 2001 murder of a former First Lady of South Africa. Because she was divorced from her husband, she no longer had a security detail. Tragically, she was brutally murdered in her home. The story details the murder, the investigation, and the media frenzy that surrounded the case. But Joan TV never gets boring because 20 plus hours of new content is added weekly. Many series of documentaries are available in 4K and they are breathtaking. Finally, Magellan TV has no ads. You should check out Magellan TV today because they have an awesome deal for criminally listed viewers. They are offering our viewers 30 days of free service. To get this amazing offer, just go to try.magellantv.com slash criminally listed. Magellan TV also makes a great gift for the holidays. They have gift cards available now. Please check out Magellan TV today because you'll find something awesome to watch and you'll be supporting criminally listed in the process. Number 3. Kevin Orlania On April 24, 2013, 8-year-old Kevin Orlania was outside Cleveland High School in Reseda, California. He was minding his own business, playing handball. Orlania was working on getting his high school diploma. He wanted to be a rapper, but if that didn't work out, he was going to study kinesiology. He wasn't a gang member who was considered a good kid. When he was outside the school, two brothers, 17-year-old Anthony Carpio and 19-year-old Michael Carpio, approached him. The brothers were members of the Rockwood Street Gang. They asked Orlania where he was from. This is a common way for members of street gangs to confront people they think are in rival gangs. Whatever Orlania said made Michael think he was a rival gang member, so he punched Orlania. Then Anthony joined in on the attack. Orlania surprised the brothers and fought them both off. Then, when he got the upper hand, Anthony pulled out a knife. He stabbed Orlania ten times in the head, neck, and torso. Then the brothers ran away. As Anthony ran away, he dropped the knife. Michael picked it up, cleaned it, and then threw it away. The brothers then got into a minivan driven by Michael's girlfriend, 19-year-old Michelle Padina. Kevin Orlania was taken to the hospital. One of the stab wounds pierced his heart. The 18-year-old was pronounced dead at 5.01 p.m. A witness said he knew one of the attackers was a gang member. He said he had a large Ellie Dodgers tattoo on the side of his head. The police were able to identify him as Michael Carpio. Michael and his brother were arrested several hours after the attack. Michael claimed that he didn't know that Anthony had a knife. Anthony claimed he wasn't at the schoolyard. What the brothers didn't know was that one of them had butt dialed a friend when they got into the van and left a voicemail. That person went to the police with a voicemail. On the voicemail, Michael says Anthony shanked a fool in the neck. He also recorded Michael talking about picking up and cleaning the knife. The Michael's girlfriend is heard saying, get down in the back seat. The brothers were charged with second degree murder. Michelle Benina pleaded no contest to being an accessory after the fact with knowledge of the crime. She was sentenced to two years of prison. The brothers went to trial in October 2014. 
One of the key pieces of evidence against them was the voicemail. Both were convicted of second degree murder. Anthony Carpio was sentenced to 16 years to life and his brother, Michael, was sentenced to 15 years to life. Anthony is serving a sentence at the Correctional Training Facility in Soldat, California. He will be able to apply for parole in February 2026. Michael is incarcerated at the R.J. Donovan Correctional Facility in San Diego, California. He is eligible for parole in August 2023. Number 2. Nicholas Walker It was early on the morning of May 5, 2013, and 33-year-old Nicholas Walker and 28-year-old Scott Simon were at a Waffle House in Orlando, Florida. The two men were strangers to each other. Although it was morning, the men weren't there because they had just woken up. They both had been drinking the night before. A waitress said that Walker was bothering Simon and his girlfriend. At one point, Walker picked up a wet floor sign and threatened to kill Simon. So Simon picked up a fire extinguisher. Realizing that things were getting out of control, Simon's girlfriend called 911. A 911 dispatcher answered the call, but Simon's girlfriend hung up before saying anything. It seemed that cooler heads prevailed because Simon and Walker didn't physically fight. Both men went out into the parking lot. Walker got into his car and drove off. A few minutes later, his car was found crashed into a guardrail and it was on fire. The fire was put out and Walker's dead body was inside of it. The 33-year-old man had been shot to death. It turned out that the police already had a clue. A few minutes before Walker was found, a call came in to 911. When Scott Simon's girlfriend put her phone back in her purse, they called 911 again. Neither she nor Simon knew that the call was made. Simon was recorded talking on his phone to his friend, 25-year-old Michael Dupree. He said he wanted to follow Walker home and kill him. Surveillance footage recorded Dupree arriving at the Waffle House with Ronald Desenier, who was in the passenger seat. Simon got into the car with the two men. They pulled up beside Walker's car and Desenier shot him. Scott Simon was arrested a few weeks after the murders and the two other men turned themselves in. The three men went to trial for first degree murder in June 2015. The key piece of evidence was the phone call where Simon talked about the murder. After seven hours of deliberation, the three men were found guilty. In August 2015, they were all sentenced to life in prison. Mastermind Scott Simon is serving a sentence at the Century Correctional Institution in Century, Florida. Michael Dupree, the driver, is incarcerated at the Everglades Correctional Institution in Miami, Florida. The shooter, Ronel Desenier, is in prison at the Appalachian Correctional Institution East in Sneeds, Florida. Number 1. Jill Thomas Grant Jill Thomas Grant was born in Long Beach, California. In 1988, when she was 16, she and her family moved to Coachella Valley, California. She graduated from Palm Desert High School in 1990. She studied math at university. In 1998, she returned to her former high school to teach upper level math. Grant had been married and she loved her two stepchildren. She had no children of her own. But that marriage came to an end. In 2013, the math teacher was dating 42 year old Michael John Franco. They lived together in a gay community in Indo, California. They had been dating for about eight months. Grant's brother, Michael Thomas, didn't like Franco. Franco was unemployed. He told people he was studying to be a truck driver. Thomas thought that Franco was dodgy and strange. They found out that Franco had a criminal record. 
In June 1990, he was convicted of robbery. In 2006, he was charged with drug and gun possession. Those charges were dismissed when he pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor disturbance charge. He was given a year of probation. Thomas told his sister about Franco's criminal record. She insisted he was a changed man. On December 23, 2013, Grant and Franco were planning on having a party at their home. Guests started to arrive, but the security guard didn't know about the party and he couldn't get a hold of Grant or Franco, so he wouldn't let them pass the gates of the community. The guests, including Grant's brother, Michael Thomas, called the couple and they couldn't get a hold of them either. But then, moments after Thomas called Franco, he called him back. Franco said that the party was cancelled. The night before, he and Grant had a huge fight and she left. He had not seen her since. Thomas thought that was very strange. If his sister had a big fight with Franco and cancelled the party, she would have told him or at least one of her friends. She definitely wouldn't have let her friends come over if the party had been cancelled. Yet, no one had heard from her. So Michael Thomas called the police. It turned out that about 13 hours earlier, the police found the dead body of a woman who matched the description of his sister. Her body had been found by golf course workers on a golf course on the city's edge. Her throat had been cut three times and it appeared she had been run over by a car. The next day, Christmas Eve, the police tracked Michael Franco's cell phone. They found him sitting in jail Thomas Grant's car. They saw him reach for a gun and he said they would have to shoot him. Instead they tased him and then arrested him. The police searched the car and they found Grant's driver's license, bank cards and cell phone. Also the gun belonged to Grant. In custody, Franco said he drank the bank accounts and was heading to Mexico because he knew he was going to jail for a long time. The police managed to collect a lot of evidence. For example, the police had surveillance footage of Franco using Grant's bank card and ATM. They also found Grant's blood on the front bumper and handprint of the hood. They found grass in the wheel well and that grass was a match to the grass of the golf course. The police believe that Franco tried to kill Grant by cutting her throat with a box cutter three times. He then dumped the body, but it turned out she wasn't dead, so she tried to run away and then he ran over her with her car. Then one of Franco's cellmates came forward with information. He said that Franco told him that he and Grant got into a big fight. He cut her throat, but this didn't kill her. He got her into the car by telling her he was going to take her for medical help. He was really going to dump her in the canal. When Grant realized that Franco was driving the wrong way, she tried to escape. So he ran her down with the car. Franco told his cellmate that he was going to beat the charges because he was going to act like he was crazy. Then he'd just have to spend seven years in a psychiatric hospital. Finally, a major piece of evidence the police had was a voicemail. At 12.26 a.m., a call was made from Franco's phone to one of his friend's phones. The friend realized it was a butt dial. But after he found out that Grant had been murdered, most likely by Franco, the message took on a new meaning and the friend went to the police. A lot of the voicemail is inaudible, but what is heard is Grant trying to convince Franco not to kill her and call for help. The first thing you hear is Franco saying, is that better? Grant says, no, then it's inaudible, then she says, no, no. Franco then says, all I wanted to do, I will take you to the hospital, I will call 911. Grant responds, wait until I can think of another idea. What if I drive the car someplace, call myself and say I was attacked? Would that work? What follows next is inaudible. Then you hear Jill say, but well, we can think of something to say. 
I'm sure we can think of something. What can we say? What do you want me to say? What should I say? Then the rest of the conversation is inaudible. The police talked to a friend of Franco's, and he said that the fight he had with Grant that night was over a drug deal. Michael Franco elaborated on that when he testified for his trial for first degree murder in April 2017. Franco said that Grant not only knew that he did meth, but sometimes she provided it for him when he didn't have any. On the night of the murder, she asked him to take some meth to help his sexual performance. He said he injected two or three shots. At some point that night, he got a text message from a friend asking for his drug dealer's phone number. This made Grant angry because she thought this violated her rule of only doing drugs in the home. Franco said he didn't remember the next 24 hours. The district attorney said that there was no evidence that Grant tolerated his drug use. He said that Franco's drug use put a strain on the relationship. She encouraged him to get help and gave him drug tests at home. The defense argued that since Franco was so messed up on drugs, he should only be found guilty of involuntary manslaughter. The jury deliberated for four hours. Michael Franco was found guilty of first degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. He is serving his sentence at the Pleasant Valley State Prison in Colinga, California. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Please don't forget to check out our new channel, Paranormally Listed. There's a link on the screen now, and there's a link in the description box below this video. Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.